reading Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and in verse 1. The Bible reads, Who is as the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. All this have I seen, and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though, the, though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. We're going to continue on in our study of Ecclesiastes. And here in chapter 8, I'm going to talk about authority, judgment, and the work of God. Authority, judgment, and the work of God. It begins here with this saying. It says, who is as the wise men? And immediately what comes to my mind is James. Keep a finger there in Ecclesiastes. We'll be back. And go to James chapter 3. Near the end of your Bible, you're going to find the book of James right after Hebrews, before Revelation in the short books. In James chapter 3, the Bible asks a similar question. We just heard Ecclesiastes and Solomon said, Who is as the wise man? In James chapter 3 and in verse 13, James writes, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So here, who is the wise man and who is endued or who has knowledge? Here James says, don't tell it. He says, show it. You don't need to say you're wise. You don't need to tell everybody how wise you are. And James affirms this. He says, who is the wise man? Let him show out. Let him show out his wisdom of a good conversation and his works with meekness and wisdom. Meekness of wisdom. 
So here he's saying that you don't need to tell it, you need to show it. Out of your conversation, out of the actions you do, out of the works that you do, that is where wisdom is shown. And here he says, do it with meekness of wisdom. In other words, a lowliness of wisdom. We know meekness, and we've studied this before, is nothing but appropriated strength. People will say that meekness is weakness. That's not true. Very strong people are meek. Moses was referred to as the meekest of all men. We know that he had killed an Egyptian. We know the, the great stories of him in the wilderness, how he was a strong leader, strong-willed even at times before God. Meekness is not weakness, no. Jesus said, I am meek, right? Jesus was not a weak man. He was a strong man. And his meekness was simply the fact that he had strength and he used it at appropriate times. It was appropriated strength. In James there, in verse 14, it says, but contrasting the one who shows out their wisdom with a good conversation. He says, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. So if you have the contrast, the bitter envying in your heart, lie not and glory not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So here the contrast is made that if you're not a wise man that is showing out your wisdom, you're of the latter, which is earthly and sensual and devilish. That bitter envying, that strife that is in your heart. Because if you are wise and you are not showing it, but rather telling it, that is what breeds that bitter envying and that strife. The heart that is full of bitter envy and strife is bent to always work wickedness. It's bent to always cause confusion. This is what happens with envy. That earthly, sensual, devilish envy is that envy seeks to rise up. It looks at someone else, and when you're envy, we use that word jealous sometimes. But jealous in the Bible is not a bad thing. It's good to be a jealous husband. The Lord is a jealous God. But we've taken the word jealous and applied it to what we think of as envy. Envy is looking at someone else and being desirous of what they have. It's a form of covetousness. Envy seeks to exalt self. It seeks to rise up. And just as the bitter envy and strife is, bitterness is almost the same portion of the envy. Bitterness sets in like a root. The Bible says that, that the root of bitterness, lest the root of bitterness spring up in you. Bitterness starts, it permeates the ground, it goes out like roots, until it has enough strength, until it has enough wherewithal that it can break forth, and that's when you see envy. Envy always starts as that root of bitterness. Bitter envy, they go together hand in hand. And when you're somebody that has a bitter spirit, when you're someone that is retaining hurts, retaining harms, not forgiving people, not letting things go, you are in danger of retaining bitterness, having that root spring up below you and shoot up through the earth, which then becomes acted out as envy. Envy thinks that I'm better. It thinks that I know better. It thinks that I can do better than everyone else around us. That's what envy does. It causes us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Why? Because when we look at somebody and we're like envious of them, it's because we automatically think that they're not as good as they seemeth to be. That's a heart matter. This person did nothing to you necessarily for you to cause envy to come upon them, for you to put envy upon them. But the thing that we need to notice about this, about the wise man, is that he is showing out, and it's with meekness and fear. His conversation shows who he is. The envious person, the bitter person, is always striving against the godly. There's an earthly spirit. There's a sensual spirit. There's a devilish spirit, and it shows forth itself as wicked roots, as evil work. We need to stop it at the root. We need to stop it when it's that root of bitterness. When we start to feel resentment against somebody, when we're hurt by somebody, and we don't do our best to forgive it, be evil, or be angry, and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, you can be hurt. You can be angry in a situation. Don't sleep on it. Don't dwell on it, because that's where that root of bitterness comes from. We need to stop it at the root. And wisdom does this. But wisdom in that quiet humility, in that meekness of spirit, in that servitude, the desire for servitude instead of sovereignty, is so much more 
than just wisdom. Wisdom acts like this. It says, but the wisdom that is above, right? We just talked about the earthly wisdom that is sensual and devilish. But the wisdom which is from above is verse 17. It says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So that's the wisdom that we need to embrace. We don't need to get caught up in envy and envying. It's the opposite of wisdom. It's foolishness to be caught up in those things. We talked a little bit about that kind of mentality and what it does. It causes discord. It causes division within a body and within a church and within our very lives. But the wise one is one that shows out through their conversation and exhibits these sort of characteristics. It's a peaceable spirit. It's a gentle spirit. It's an easy to be entreated spirit. No, but someone can come to the wise and ask and treat them, ask questions, and they're not easily going to be agitated. They're full of mercy. They extend mercy to others. They're full of good fruits. There's no partiality. There's no hypocrisy. This is what wisdom should attain. Wisdom should not talk about itself all the time. Wisdom should show these characteristics all of the time instead. There is great humility in a wise man. There is great meekness in somebody that seeks servitude before they seek sovereignty. You know what that means? It means you seek to serve others before you seek to lord over others, to be sovereign, to be the ruler over a situation, a state, a, a, a place, what so have you. And we see then that it's pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. All those things are the spiritual uh, outpourings of the wise person. That is the good conversation. Those are the works. They come out in these ways, and it's very nice, it's very lovely. Wise people are not people that are coarse, that are harsh, that are hard to get along with. Why? Because they show out these traits, and they do it in a quiet humility. They do it in a meek and quiet spirit, even as a man, appropriating the strength that they do have. That's wise. Wisdom here shows that it's not always seeking to lead, but it also gives characteristics that are very, uh, lead themselves very favorable to one that would lead. Wisdom doesn't exalt self, but is exalted in the end. And we see here that, that proverb, that, that saying come forth, where it says great leaders were servants first, right? People always say that. They say that the greatest leaders were servants first. I've experienced that in the workplace even. The greatest leaders that I have started at the bottom and they worked their way up. They didn't just show up with a college degree and a tie on and try to be the boss. The greatest leaders were servants first and this, they serve always. In other words, they don't stop serving when they become the leader. They don't stop serving when they become the boss. As the leader, above all, they are still a servant at heart because they have grown up in that, because they have lived that, wisdom acted out, showed out of their conversation. That's even how they got to the position of being leader in the first place. There's a purity, there's a peaceableness, there's a gentleness, there's an easy to be entreated, easy to get along with, mercy without hypocrisy, without partiality. That's what comes and that's what shows out of a wise person who lives the truth and doesn't always try to talk about how wise and how wonderful they are. If you were to look back in Ecclesiastes with that as a base, talking about the, the wise man, it says here in Ecclesiastes 8, it says, who is as the wise man? Who is comparable with a wise man? The question is asked again, and we can remember all the characteristics that we saw what that would be upon this person that is as the wise man. Here he says this, and again, you don't need to answer this. If we were to ask anybody who is wise here, it wouldn't be wise to answer the question, right? Because others should see it. If you're a wise person, you don't need to tell everybody, right? Others see it. And that's what it's saying when it says they show it out. And that's the same thing that we see here. Who is as the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? You know those people that are always trying to tell you how to interpret the Bible. How, this is what I think. This is what I think. This is what I think. And more often they will appear foolish. But it's the wise one who doesn't always try to force their opinion on a situation, but shows what they believe about the situation. It's best to show what you believe about the Bible than just tell everybody. And I've experienced this in my own life and in witnessing, especially people that know you. You show them the Bible by how you live, how you act, how you behave 
believe. Because then they'll understand that you actually believe what you're preaching to them. You actually live what you're preaching to them. Your testimony becomes a very firm foundation upon which your preaching is established. You don't need that at the door. And this is why I often laugh at the people who are like the greatest soul winners ever, but they're never in church. They don't have a testimony that's going to reach anybody that knows them. They don't have a testimony that's going to, that's going to take them to the next level, which they're soul winners all the time. No, they go to the door of strangers. They've remembered the script. They know how to lead somebody to Christ. Those are the same ones that are going to be boasting and glorying about it, telling everybody how wise they are. No, the wise one is known. The wise one doesn't need to say that he's wise. The wise one shows it out of their conversation. It says in the second portion of that uh, first verse, it says, A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. So you see the boldness on the face of the wise. You see the shine on the face of the wise. In other words, it's detectable that someone's wise. They don't need to tell you. Who's wise in this room? Hey, we don't need to ask that. We don't need to raise hands. Everybody knows it all around you. Your friends know it. Your family knows it. Your church uh, friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ, they all know if you're wise. Why? Because you've showed it. You don't need to tell everybody. And now here, he, after giving this as kind of like a foundation to the next step in the teaching uh, that um, Solomon is going to give unto his son or to his main... Um, um, the, the main recipient of the message that he has here, he's going to start to exhort to be wise. He starts to counsel wisdom and what that really means. And we talked about it from James, right? And we talked about humble servitude and what that means. Here he's going to talk about the exact same thing. Verse 2 says, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. He is charging the hearer of this book. He is charging the reader of this book. Hey, if you're wise, people are going to see it. And he says, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment. What is he saying here? Well, just like it says in Romans chapter 13, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher power. Obey the command of the king. First and foremost, with our heart, we obey the Lord. But we need to understand that this is also, as it is in this context, the oath of God. It is also a solemn promise before a divine witness that we can make. When the Bible says in, in uh, Romans chapter 13, obey them, where it says, let the soul be subject unto the higher power, or other verses like that, obey them that have the rule over you for the watch for your soul. It says all these things about obeying someone before your wife submit to your husband, husband submit unto Christ, children obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And all those verses that talk about it, this is the same thing that he's saying here. He's saying keep the king's commandment. He's saying obey those that have the rule over you. And this is in the oath of God. He says, and that in regard of the oath of God. What's the oath of God here? Well, you can solemnly promise before God. You can make an oath. That's what that is. It's a solemn promise before a divine witness that, hey, God, you've told me to obey my husband, the wives. God, you've told me to obey my parents, the children. God, you've told me to obey the Lord myself, the men in here, whoever, your boss, the king, whoever it is. And you can say, God, I want to do that. God, in, in the bottom of my heart, I, I want that. I make an oath to do that. I counsel thee, the king that keeps commandment. I counsel thee to yield to the authorities that are before you in the Lord. And God will help you with that if you solemnly oath, you solemnly promise that that is your intent. Understanding, hey, we're all sinners before God. But if that is your promise, if that is your willingness, wisdom is then shown in you through your obedience to this action. Verse 3 says, Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. The wisdom here is that you should stay in the sight of your king. You should stay in the sight of your husband. You should stay in the sight, children, of your parents. Don't be so hasty to flee from that. What does that mean? We often like to get out of the sight of those that are watching over us, right? Kids try to sneak away and find a room. When another room, when Caleb's in another room and it's quiet, I know that something bad is about to happen. And that's when I, that's when I go, he was hasty to get out of my sight. Why? Because he was off doing something sneaky. You've often heard people say like, oh, I can't wait until I'm out from under my parents' authority. I, I can't wait until I'm out from my boss's authority and I'm my own boss. I can't wait till I get out of church and I can go live my life however I want. I can't wait until I'm out of such and such and such an authority. Be not hasty. Stay in his sight. Do not be so hasty to leave 
the person that is overseeing you only in the Lord. Uh -uh. Be restrained in your spirit by having the person that is your authority over top of you. What, what's that saying? It says, when the, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? When the boss is away, that's when we show what kind of employee we actually are. But some people are hasty to get out of their boss's sight so they can go on and be lazy. Some kids are hasty to get out of the sight of their parents so they can go and disobey what their parents want them to do. Some wives are hasty to get out of the sight of their husband so that they can do whatsoever they will. And that's the wrong mentality. Why? Because you're stepping out of the realm of the protection that God has given you. And you're stepping out of the realm as the wisest man in the Bible next to Jesus Christ is explaining to you. Don't be hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever he pleaseth him. Here's the reality is that your boss is not answering to you. Your boss, as far as your sight is concerned, is doing whatsoever pleaseth him. Well, what's your job in those situations? Don't seek to be out from under his desires. Don't seek to be out from under whatsoever is pleasing to your boss, to your master, to your king. No, rather serve in it. Allow for the current and present situation that you are in. Not so that you can stand in an evil matter off out of his sight. No, be under the authority that you have. Be close to the authority that you have been placed under. There's a great uh, verse in Psalms when it says, the, the heart of the servant looketh to the hand of his master. I'm just, I'm just paraphrasing and quoting this. But that's the mentality. The cupbearer is waiting for the king who is sitting at his throne to simply... He's, he's just watching the hand, watching the hand, waiting, seeing what the hand would be. And when the master goes, I would like the cup, the cup bearer is ready. The wise servant is always looking to the hand of his own master. He's waiting for the hand to signify the next move, the next position, the next step. And everyone who is under authority, don't be hasty to get out from under that authority. Be waiting, watching, watching the hand. Prepare to do exactly what that authority wants from you in the exact moment that it is asked of you. That is the wise man. That is the one who knoweth the interpretation of the thing. That is the one who is full of boldness and has that shining face, who would receive the counsel to simply obey the authorities that they are placed under. Verse 4 says this. It says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? We need to recognize that there is a power over top of us. It's the word of the king. It's the authority of the king's spoken word. Whatsoever he desireth, he doeth whatsoever he desireth. And what is it to you? Who, who's going to say, what doest thou? He is the king. He is the ruler. He is the supreme. He is your authority. And every one of us has a context whereby we are placed under that same type of authority. Where the word of your boss is, there is power. And who may say, what doest thou? Where the word of your husband is, wives, there is power. And who may say, what doest thou? Children, where the word of your parents is, there is power. And who can say unto them, what doest thou? What are you doing? What? No, they are supreme. They are the ruler. They are the ones that have the final say. They do whatsoever pleaseth them. And what business is it of yours when you are under their authority? The king is the one that has the authority and not you. But don't think of this, as we often do, as if it's oppression, right? It's comfort. And here's why. Because the decision here, whatsoever pleaseth him, in verse 3, is completely up to the king. The instruction coming from the mouth is completely in the hands of the king. All the direction, all the instruction, all the next steps, all the next moves are completely in the hand of the authority. What he wants, you just obey. He has the power. It is our responsibility to yield unto it. Put this in any kind of context of which you're living in. Verse 5 says, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil. There's that comfort. If you're keeping the commandment, if you're under the proper authority that God has put you under, obeying the higher authority in every situation of your life, you shall feel no evil thing. 
And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. In other words, the wise man's heart is always discerning the time and the judgment, like Solomon talked about earlier in the book when he said there's a time for this, there's a time for that, there's a time to kill, there's a time to revive, there's a time to love, there's a time to hate. And the wise discern in the situation when they were keeping the commandment, obeying the higher authority within their life, they discern the time and the judgment of every situation of life. So as I am walking my life and my boss tells me something, if I don't agree offhand, I can appeal to the higher authority. But if there's nothing that the higher authority has to say that would contradict my boss, talking about Jesus, my boss, and then myself, and my boss tells me to go sweep the floor, and I go to the commandment of the king and look through the scriptures and see whether those things be so, does he actually have authority to make me sweep the floor? Yep, there's nothing that would contradict that, so I obey the authority that I'm under, and I sweep the floor. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall fear no evil. And like I said, that's the reward. The decisions were the king's. The direction was the king's. I was simply to obey it and yield unto it. And it's a great place to be in. It was a wonderful day in my life when I stopped kicking against the pricks, when I stopped fighting against my boss's every decision, when I stopped thinking in pride that I knew better, that I had a better decision. A lot of the times I did. A lot of the times I had a better idea. I knew how something would play out. But at some point, I decided that whatever my boss says to me, it's of no regard to me. How can I say, what doest thou? How can I say, what are you thinking? What are you doing? What are you doing in this situation? No, I set in my heart as an oath, as a decision before God to obey the commandment. And my boss started telling me, hey, go do this. And in my mind and in my flesh, I'm like, oh, it's a dumb decision. But I would say, no, nope, I'm going to do it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the day that I did that, my whole outlook and my whole mentality about obeying authorities completely changed. Do you know what happened? Now I stand here this day at my position higher than the boss that I was serving. Why? Because God exalted me in my humility. I just set myself to watch the ruler's hands, wait for him to say go, to do, to walk, to talk, to sweep, to whatever he had me do, I just did it. I didn't kick back. I didn't argue. I just shut up, put my head down, and did my job. And the Lord richly blessed me in that. Why? Because it's scriptural to do that. I didn't invent something new. It is biblical to obey the higher authorities. Children, if that's your parents, just do what they say. Wives, if that's your husband, just do what he says. Husbands, to Christ, to their boss, just do what they say and it will be well with you. Look at what the Bible says. He shall feel no evil thing. All the responsibility when the plan of my boss failed miserably, which I thought might happen, fell on him. I didn't get blamed for it. I just did what my boss said. Wives, think about that. Your husband asks you to do something and you don't think it's a good idea. You do it anyways. It all falls apart. It's completely on the shoulders of the husband. Children, the same thing. If, if they tell you to go do something and you do it, it's your responsibility not to question them, not to wonder how it's going to act out down the line. It's your responsibility to just do it. And when you just do it, you will be amazed at how God works in your life. Like he did in my life when I went from being the servant to the master. Not because I am anything great, but because I was in my proper position, yielded to God, yielded to my boss, and it was noticed. The wisdom, the light on my face, the boldness shined, and someone took notice, and I got promoted within my job because of it. And that's how every aspect of our life works in regard to obedience. We obey the higher authorities and let God promote us, let God exalt us, let God give us leader position greater challenges, greater opportunities to do more for him. That is right, and that is good, and that is scriptural. The wise in heart is patient. They judge, they discern, they read out situations, but they're always looking not to kick against their authorities, but to do what their authorities say. Only the highest authority, and that's all it is. You look at your boss, and they tell you to do something. You look at your husband, you look at your, your, your parents, and they tell you to do something. If it doesn't seem right, the only way of appeal that you have is the Bible. If the Bible has nothing to say for it, your sole responsibility is to do as you're told. Look to the hands of your master. Now this all does, even though I'm, I'm telling you that it's a good position to be in because I've lived it out practically, because the Bible here says they shall feel no evil. I'm trying to give you Bible, I'm trying to give you real life examples and explain to you that it's a good position to be in, to be yielded unto your high authority. But we still don't think that's right. We still don't think that's easy. Our flesh 
box up. Our flesh gets confused and goes, no, that doesn't seem right. Why? Because our hearts are constantly bent to self-servitude. Our hearts are constantly bent, rather than lifting up and exalting others to a position that is more prominent than us, our hearts are set to lift ourselves up, to puff ourselves up, to do what I want, when I want, how I want. We don't like to wait for things. We don't like to judge things unless it's unrighteous judgment. And often, in regard to the purposes that are greater than ours, being the kings, being the boss, being whoever is over us, we don't see those purposes. Why? Because we're so focused on the purpose that my heart has, what my heart wants to do, what I want to do. Me, 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 my, my, my. That's the world that we live in. And sadly, it's been bred into each and every one of us, whether we're saved Christian or not. We are all given that same flesh, and that same flesh just loves its Self. That's why Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because you would just love your neighbor so much. Because all of us love ourselves more than anything. It's almost like one of those, one of those, uh, what, what are the, the, the long goals, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's one of those, one of those targets that you set that you'll never actually hit. We were just talking about that at work. We always like to set targets that are completely impossible. Loving your neighbor as yourself, that's completely impossible. I love myself so much. I can only do that through Christ. Only by having the love of God in me and motivating me can I ever love anyone greater than myself. Why? Because myself loves me more than anything. And the Bible does record in verse 6, it says, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore the misery of man is great upon them. And that's what it is. Why such misery? Because we, we don't like being in this position. We don't like having to see time, see judgment, see the greater purpose, see the greater uh, authority, and then yield to it. Why do we have such misery? Because we have no control over the situation. That bugs people more than anything, is not having control, not being in charge. That's what your heart wants. Your heart wants to be the sole deliverer of its own will. Verse 7 says, For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? Our hearts always want to know when it comes to a purpose, we want to know what the purpose is. We want to know when it's happening. We want to know why it's happening. And we want to know it now. Our ultimate desire is to always be completely in control of things. Control freaks, right? We're motivated entirely to have our whole situation molded and manipulated to the purpose that we see at the end of the line. But how does that work in regard to faith? Faith is something that is an evidence that is not seen. In other words, faith takes steps that you don't see the next you don't see the end. You don't see what the result is going to be. You may not even see three feet in front of you. So therefore, when we take steps of faith by what? Yielding to our authorities, trusting that God's going to care for us, even if we're making a bonehead decision that our authority asked us to. Faith says, God, I don't think this is a good idea for my boss to tell me to do such and such. God, I don't think it's a good idea for my husband to tell me to do such and such. I think it's a terrible idea. But Lord, by faith, I give control to you. I relinquish my control. And I'm trusting that when I obey my authority, the authority you've placed me under, it will work to my better. It will work better for me than if I'm to kick against it and to fight against it. Lord, I'm putting myself in your hands by placing myself under this authority. And you're always safer there because you're in the will of God, and because he commands that you're not going to fear, feel evil when you're in that position. Why? Because even though it looks like you're submitting to your parents, even though it looks like you're just submitting to your husband, even though it just looks like you're submitting to your boss, you're submitting to God. That's the ultimate bottom line. Why? Because we've just by judgment, and we've just by analysis of the time, discerned that the higher authority has no problem with you obeying the under authority. And when you obey the under authority by connection, you're obeying all the way up. And that is when you are in the will of God, and that is when you are safest. Believe it or not, your flesh will hate that. Your flesh will hate being out of control of a situation. But that's faith, and that's what pleases God. Servitude is always right, even though it's unnatural, even though it doesn't feel good, even though it doesn't seem right. And why is it like that? Well, because our heart, again, loves self. And if it's unrestrained, it'll always be destined towards deceit and wickedness. Because that's what the heart is. Above all things, it's desperately wicked, full of deceit and wickedness. And it will always be that way. Therefore, that heart must be yielded unto something else. 
For us as a saved Christian, we would always yield the motivations and desires of our heart unto the Spirit of God. Let Him have control over them. Let Him yield let him guide you, the yielded heart, in the direction that he wants you to go. And that's how you end up being like a Philip, a Philip out in the road, meeting a eunuch in the middle of the desert. Because he yielded the motivations of his heart to the Holy Spirit that took him to a man that needed to find Jesus. Right? So we need to be in that same position, in servitude. It's unnatural. It's not something that our flesh loves, but it is right. And before God, that is where you will be most blessed. Verse 8 says, There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. No man can actually subdue and restrain and control the Spirit. But who can? The Spirit of God. Give your spirit over into the Spirit of God. Now that it is alive and quickened from the dead, allow the Spirit of God to move in you and to control you in these situations. I love what this verse says. I love this. It says, there is no discharge in that war. There is no getting out of this battle. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given. There is no discharge from this battle. Because look what happens. When you are spiritually dead and your spirit then in born again situation rises because uh, the spirit hath breathed life into it and you are resurrected spiritually speaking. Yes, now your spirit and the spirit of God are in unity. But you're not discharged from that war. Why? Because upon salvation, you have this problem. Galatians chapter 5, 17. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary the one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. You're always going to be stuck in that situation, you're always going to be stuck in this war whereby there is a part of you constantly kicking against the rightful authority over you. There is constantly the flesh lusting against the spirit. And that's the problem that we have. So what do we have to do? We have to make that flesh yield itself to the higher authority. It needs to be in subjection unto the higher authority. And what is that? That's the spirit. Servitude, again, is always contrary to what we want, but it is always right. And it has its rewards. Like I said, protection, healing, strength, direction, blessings from God. That's what comes from being in, in servitude and under the proper authorities that are in your life. Contrawise, we can also look that there is a reckoning for disobedience. There is a reckoning for fighting against the authorities that God has you under. Verse 9 says, All this have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy. And what it's saying there a little bit before that is, in verse 9 it says, If you won't yield, do not be surprised when you are ruled over unto your own hurt. This is what happens. When I was constantly pricking against my boss, I was constantly put in a position, when I was kicking against him, I was constantly put in a position where I had to yield unto him more. Where my job became more difficult, more strenuous, more challenging to be in that role. Because this is how God works it. If you will not yield to the authority that he wants you to, you will be placed in subjection unto it against your own will. Think of Babylon. Think of the preaching of Jeremiah when he called out to Israel and said, Give up. Yield yourselves to Babylon. Give up. You know, throw the white flag. Submit yourselves. Give up. They're going to destroy you. And Israel, for 70 years, was placed under the authority of Babylon. Babylon ruled them to their own hurt. Why? Because they wouldn't yield themselves first to God and second to Babylon who God placed over them. That's a picture of us when we won't yield to our authorities. We're not yielding unto God. Don't be surprised when God puts a taskmaster master over you. He did it to Israel in Egypt. He did it to Israel in Persia. He did it to Israel in Babylon. He's done it time and time again. Or he's taken in individual situations and put a king over them that was wicked, that was wrong, that was ungodly. He's placed them under authorities. And look, in the New Testament, by the time Christ came, who was Israel under then? The Romans. He will always put you under an authority against your will if you are unwilling to submit to the authorities that he has you under by your will. 
We need to make the decision consciously to do what God wants in all ways. And sometimes what he wants seems contrary, but if you don't have his higher authority to trump the authority you're under, sorry, you just have to do what is commanded. Verse 10 says, And so I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also is vanity. How surprising is it that the person that was fighting against the authority ends up destroyed without remembrance? The person that was trying to exalt themselves in a situation and be the Lord over their own destiny ends up destroyed and forgotten. It's not surprising at all because that's how God has played out his story over and over and over as he as he showed us through his people Israel and as he continually shows us through the examples of our own lives. Verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do wicked. The only reason then that a wicked heart rises up is because the sentence was waited upon. We love the mercy of God. We love the grace of God. We love the long suffering of God. But because God gives it to us, it allows place for our wicked hearts to grow and grow and grow and grow in wickedness. This is why we need to have restraint. This is why God puts authorities in our lives. He does it on purpose so that sentence will be placed upon us. So that, um, so that, not that it would be some harsh or some wicked, so that the judgment would be made upon us. In other words, you would be told what to do and you would have to make a decision speedily. Because sentence was not made against an evil work, because you weren't corrected immediately, that is why the heart is fully set to do wicked. Sometimes that mercy, sometimes that long suffering allows for more and for more and for more of our own heart to brew up in ourselves. We need to fight against that before we get it. Even if our authorities aren't necessarily noticing the bitterness that's brewing in your heart, you need to recognize it within your own heart and destroy it quickly. Get it out of the way. Otherwise, you are just going to get more and more fully set to do wicked. Judgment and sentence, if it's executed speedily, notice we're not talking about hastily, but as soon as the judgment is made, it is made speedily. Hastily has the idea of just shooting from the hip, right? Judgment, 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 and just all of these things are made. But no, when judgment is made speedily, it will limit the uprising of our wicked hearts. And praise God when you're in a situation and you know you've done wrong, and he judges you quickly because you know that that will help you get corrected quickly. Would to God we would be able to correct ourselves before we got to that situation. But it is actually a great act of mercy when the Lord is quick to rebuke and to chasten and to correct his own children. We need to apply that to our own lives and consider those things. That when we are corrected, quickly correct and get back on the right path. Because otherwise we are negating the swift and speedy judgment of God. And thereby next time it might not be so swift. And you might find yourself further and further and further off the straight and narrow and subject to more correction in the end. Verse 12 says, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as the shadow, because he feareth not before God. And this is talking about having the proper fear and the proper reverence. And we all hate that term, but the Bible records that Wives are to fear. Children have that same sense of fear. We're always to fear the authorities that are over us. Why? Because the judgment, if swift, it hurts. So we're to have the proper reverence. We're to have the proper fear. And above all things, we should have fear for the Lord God. And that's where really the fear of our parents, the fear of our, 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 our spouses, the fear, you know, when you're, when you're ordering it up, the fear of your boss comes from is a right fear of the Lord God Almighty, right? You are putting the position correctly and you are having the right heart and the right spirit with regard to the situation that you are in. Verse 14 then, Solomon begins to unwind this teaching and, and, and he starts to kind of do that thing where, where he's kind of reasoning and trying to deduce and trying to deduct what he has learned from all this. And he says, there is a vanity which is done upon earth that there be a just man unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said again that this also 
is vanity. So he first started saying that the evil worker, the sinner, it shall not be well with them. And then he says the wicked one, it shall not be well with them. But it shall be well with those that fear God. But then he talks here about the just man to whom it happeneth according to the wicked. And the wicked man to whom it happeneth according to the just. Again, this is bringing all this into the position where we can understand that this is a wise man looking at what he has learned in his life and trying to reason it. And he's reached the point where he understands that he doesn't have a grasp of everything. So sometimes in life, he can, he can order his steps and know what is going to come next. And he can, he can have everything thought out and use his wisdom to, to map out a situation to make righteous judgments. And then in the end, he did well and he received well. But there's also times in his life, he is highlighting here, where he does well and then receives as if he has done wickedly. Well, what is the testimony of this? Well, it's just vanity. It's just, again, highlighting the vanity of our lives. He's not taking away from the fact of what he had just taught. He is just highlighting the fact that, hey, sometimes you'll do right and bad things will happen. Sometimes you'll do wicked and good things will happen. This is life. The rain falleth on the just and the unjust alike. He says in verse 16, he says, When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the busyness, that is done upon the earth, for there are also those that neither day nor night seeth sleep with all his eyes. Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet shall he not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man seek to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. What he's saying here is that God's ways are quite often just unknown to us. We don't know what his plan is in the end of a situation. We don't know how things are going to all align in the end of a thing. We don't know how all these terrible circumstances we're going through are going to work together for good. We don't know how all these good situations are going to leave us broken and with nothing in the end. The work of God is something that though you're a wise man, you may not be able to find it out. Solomon here in humility is admitting that, that things don't always play out the way expected, that people aren't always blessed when they do good, that people that do wicked aren't always, you know, chasing for it immediately. This is how life works. But one thing he does want to highlight and does want to point out is that the bottom line is when you are in this life, Remember, he's been talking about labor. He's been talking about rejoicing in the works of the hand. He's been talking about how you live your life and do the best to get along, to get along, yielding unto God in the fear of God. And the best way to do it is where we talked about right now. Being under authority. Being in the proper position that God has for you. Having your heart, even by an oath, set to just do the next step that God has for you. God gives you a command. You obey it and step. God gives you a command, you obey it and step. And this is how we walk and this is how we grow in our Christian life. And all of us are comfortable with that. If God tells me to do something, of course I will do it. But what happens when God telling you to do something is your boss telling you to sweep the floor. And you're like, this is not part of the master plan. I'm not getting closer to my dreams and my goals and my desires for serving the Lord by sweeping a floor. Well, how do you know? You have found no contradictory evidence from the Bible, from the Word of God, to support you being disobedient in sweeping the floor. And yet you're going to kick against that authority? That was God telling you to sweep the floor. This is what we need to understand about the work of God. We can't always know the end from the beginning. We can't always know what His plans are. And no man, even a wise man, is able to find out these things. So what do we have to do? We have to trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. And this is the faith walk that a Christian takes. This is how my life is able to be manipulated by God without the, the hypothetical you know, burning bush. Without God literally stepping into my life, which is recorded once in Scripture, never repeated again. And yet there's people still today that are looking for a burning bush. They're looking for a great sign from God. What would you have me to do, Lord? I need a sign from you. And your boss is like, pay attention, sweep the floor. And you're like, God, what do you want me to do? With No, God wants you to sweep the floor, right? That's how God works in your life. I, we went through situations with moving, where we're moving from place to place. Caleb's three years old, and this is going to be his fourth house. We did not plan for this, but every step of the way was men intervening in my life to 
have God's will applied to it. I believe that. Step by step by step, I take a step by faith and do what God wills by obeying, unfortunately, what the landlord wants, and that's get out. God wanted to give me a promotion, but he didn't just throw money at me and say, ha, you know, name it and claim it. No, God took my unwillingness to lead or to yield to my boss and use that as a teaching point for me to understand that yielding to my boss was God's will to get me more money. When I was recently saved and I wanted time to read the Bible, I didn't know that God's intervention for my life was a transport truck in, in the side of the vehicle I was riding. But I had a year to read through my Bible with a kink in my neck and, and with a sword. We don't know the work of God, but we do know that each step of the way, He is using the circumstances and the situations in your life to move you towards the work of God, to move you towards His purpose. And when you obey the authorities that are over you, that's just another way that God exhibits his overarching authority as the king unto each and every one of us. And we all need to be looking for the king's hand to move as his cupbearers, as his servant. The next time the king goes, oh, I'll have, you've got to be ready there to do what he wants. Trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey. That's the faith walk. And that's what we need to understand. More and more, each and every one of us have this trouble. I know we do. I have the same problem. My flesh hates submitting to authority. I try to make my flesh submit to my spirit. It hates that. It likes nothing more than to just do what flesh wants to do. But I need to make it submit. By submitting unto the authorities that are over me, and submitting unto the authorities that are over them, and having that servant's heart, because that servant's heart can be exalted in the kingdom of God. Amen. Father God,